بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Dear colleagues this is the second part of the uh, lecture of the orbital imaging and you know from the first part we have uh, uh, dealt with the uh, anatomy and the examination techniques and the, we uh, divided the orbit into uh, five or six uh, anatomic uh, zones and we started by evaluation of the globe then evaluation of the optic nerve and now we are going to complete the uh, rest of the orbital structures uh, starting by evaluation of the lacrimal gland and you know the lacrimal gland is normally located in the superior lateral aspect of the orbital cavity and uh, we uh, consider lacrimal gland lesions into two main categories if you see a unilateral lacrimal gland pathology then you think of a 50 percent inflammatory disease and 50 percent neoplastic lesions then uh, uh, one of the most common inflammatory diseases affecting the lacrimal gland is that we call the uh, lacrimal uh, pseudotumor as we will discuss uh, uh, sooner then acute and chronic dacryoadenitis inflammation of the lacrimal gland and also inflammatory pseudotumor may result in enlargement of the lacrimal gland with homogeneous or heterogeneous uh, contrast enhancement and sometimes you can see marginal enhancement indicating the presence of an abscess for example like this one affecting the right lacrimal gland an orbital pseudotumor is an inflammatory uh, process of unknown uh, etiology. It uh, can affect the orbital fat, also it can affect the lacrimal gland and uh, sometimes the extraocular muscles. The uh, result of this disease is you got the uh, uh, smudged or dirty appearance of the intraorbital fat because of congestion and inflammation. And also you got some swelling of the lacrimal gland and one or more of the extraocular muscles, particularly the lateral rectus muscle. This is an example. I will discuss in details the orbital pseudotumor later on in this lecture. The neoplastic lesions uh, in the lacrimal gland may be benign, like uh, pleomorphic adenoma or uh, dermoid cyst, for example. And this is a good example of a uh, dermoid cyst containing fat in the region of the lacrimal gland on the left side. Then, uh, uh, malignant lesions in the lacrimal gland may represent a carcinoma, lymphoma, metastatic deposits, or any kind of uh, primary malignancy. Then uh, look at this patient who is known to have multiple myeloma and presented by proptosis in the lacrimal gland swelling that proved to be a myelomatous lesion in the uh, lacrimal gland. Also, this is a rare odd. Uh, uh, presentation of a lacrimal gland swelling but the clinical data are very important to be able to judge in the possible underlying pathology then if you see a, a lacrimal gland lesion like this one and you want to discriminate between benign and the malignant lesions and you want to also to discriminate between inflammatory and the neoplastic conditions the first of all is to look at the clinical data then there are sometimes manifestations of malignancies like uh, destruction of the bone adjacent to the lacrimal gland the lateral orbital margin intracranial extension of the disease and the presence of metastatic deposits in the scanned area or elsewhere in the body then uh, here you see a mass in the region of the uh, left lacrimal gland the mass is of low signal in the t1 weighted image and it showed almost homogeneous post contrast enhancement this lesion may represent a neoplasm and may represent an inflammatory pathology 50 percent for this and 50 percent for that then uh, if you don't have any leading uh, uh, clinical data or other uh, imaging criteria then you have to biopsy this lacrimal gland to 
reach the final diagnosis, which was in this case adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. And sometimes you see affection of the lacrimal gland on the left side like this one and this affection extends to involve the lateral rectus muscle but uh, the rest of the scans showed there are multiple bulky uh, lymph nodes in the neck and the nodes are homogeneous and they do not contain calcium these are the criteria of uh, lymph nodes uh, uh, secondary to lymphoma then you uh, predict that this is a case of lymphoma affecting the uh, cervical lymph nodes as well as the uh, left parotid gland and also the left submandibular salivary gland with multiple submental uh, lymph nodes, upper deep cervical lymph nodes, submandibular uh, lymph nodes, this is the normal submandibular salivary gland and the group of lymph nodes uh, surrounding it are known as the submandibular group of uh, lymph nodes then you it's easy for you to diagnose this as lacrimal gland lymphoma then what happens if you uh, have bilateral almost symmetrical enlargement of the lacrimal uh, gland then you think of a systemic disease and there are a lot of uh, systemic diseases that can affect the lacrimal glands bilaterally and almost symmetrically including the autoimmune diseases particularly the Sjogren and Mikulik syndrome also sarcoid can affect the lacrimal glands mixed edema Wagner granulomatosis amyloidosis Graves disease and also lymphoma can affect the lacrimal glands bilateral and symmetric then uh, this is a case of proved sarcoid uh, involvement of the lacrimal glands you see the left as well as the right lacrimal glands are uh, uh, almost symmetrically enlarged they show homogeneous post contrast uh, enhancement and this is a known case of sugar syndrome affecting the lacrimal glands which are here uh, not that uh, symmetric the left lacrimal gland is uh, prominent more enlarged than the right lacrimal gland both uh, glands showed homogeneous post contrast enhancement and uh, this is also a case of Mikulix disease showing a bilateral almost symmetrical involvement of the lacrimal glands showing homogeneous post contrast enhancement and this is a case of lymphoma affecting the lacrimal glands on both sides that are enlarged with homogeneous enhancement and you can appreciate the degree of bilateral almost symmetric uh, proptosis then if you have a unilateral lacrimal gland pathology think think of infection and uh, neoblast as a differential diagnosis but if you have bilateral lacrimal gland affection in you think of uh, systemic disease and i have mentioned the list of the differential diagnosis now we came to the fourth uh, anatomic compartment which is uh, the extraocular muscles extraocular muscles are uh, uh, are handled f by the same way almost like the lacrimal gland if you see a single muscle affection think of inflammation or neoblast but if you see multiple muscle affection and most likely you are dealing with Graves disease then uh, if you look here then you know that the Graves disease is uh, uh, a metabolic disease which is associated usually with thyroid uh, uh, abnormalities and this disease can be unilateral or bilateral uh, with deposition of mucopolysaccharide protein complex within the uh, muscles as well as within the fat and this will result in uh, almost symmetrical enlargement of multiple extraocular muscles unilaterally or bilaterally together with infiltration of the intraorbital fat by this uh, mucopolysaccharide protein complex leading to enlargement of the or increase of the volume of the orbital contents and consequently you got bilateral almost symmetrical proptosis the most two common muscles affected by Graves disease are the inferior rectus muscle and the, the medial rectus muscle and you should know that this is not the optic nerve because you don't see the lens inside the globe whenever you see the lens inside the, the globe then you are uh, uh, cutting in the region of the optic nerve 
but if you see the globe like this either you are cutting inferiorly or superiorly then you are uh, dealing with the inferior rectus or the superior rectus then the inferior recti are enlarged the medial recti are also enlarged and homogeneously enhanced and you see that one of the most important characters of graves disease is the affection of the muscle belly not the ends of the muscle then you got an elliptical configuration of the affected muscle and this is bilateral symmetrical affection of the medial rectus uh, muscle one of the most commonly affected muscles in the orbit by uh, graves disease and uh, many times you got involvement of almost all extraocular muscles bilaterally here you see the lateral and the, the medial recti the inferior rectus the superior rectus levator complex all are involved by the uh, graves disease and this is MRI T2 with an image in the coronal plane showing Graves disease affection affecting the extraocular muscles medial inferior lateral and the superior recti on both sides and this is also a good example of Graves disease which is also known as thyroid orbitopathy and uh, you can appreciate the involvement of most of the muscles the least to be affected is the lateral rectus muscle and here you can see involvement of the medial rectus the inferior rectus here is much more affected and in this uh, area you see the uh, superior rectus and the elevator palpebrae complex muscles as i have mentioned before then this is also once more another example uh, of graves disease with bilateral affection of the medial recti in the coronal image you see also that the inferior recti are involved the superior recti are also involved then graves disease will uh, result in uh, 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 increase in the orbital content as well as in the orbital fat volume which will appear dirty as i have mentioned due to reticulations and uh, the position of abnormal material Graves disease can also affect the lacrimal gland and the eyelid it can also the aff affect the optic nerve but the most commonly involved structures in the orbit are the extraocular muscles and the uh, the fat uh, uh, also by enlargement of the extraocular muscles you may got compression of the optic nerve near the optic frame then uh, sometimes you are uh, uh, asked to diagnose a case of a proptosis uh, by CT or by MRI then you have the scan and you feel that uh, the the or the globes are symmetric and you don't got the uh, feeling that they are proptotic one of the best way of the best ways to judge a proptosis is to draw a line between the anterior aspects of the lateral orbital walls normally one third of the globe should be behind this line but if you see that the globe is totally anterior to the line or even more anterior to the line then you know that there is bilateral uh, proptosis sometimes in the course of acromegaly there there may be some enlargement of the extraocular muscles which are usually not symmetric and uh, affect uh, uh, different muscles uh, according to the disease then uh, by this way you can see also that the patient had bilateral uh, proptosis but of course the most important here for the diagnosis is the presence of acromegalic features in the patient and in the skull of course as you know then uh, single muscle affection may be the sequelae of inflammation or tumor and one of the common inflammatory lesions in the orbit is the orbital pseudotumor as i have mentioned and in such condition in the affection of the muscle is known as myositis pseudotumor the patient with orbital pseudotumor ha has usually a congested uh, eye and um, yeah, there is frequent uh, lacrimation with uh, signs of inflammation in the conjunctiva also there may be some proptosis due to affection of uh, the extraocular muscles and affection of the lacrimal gland as well as the orbital fat then uh, uh, single muscle affection may be also due to primary or secondary neoplasms like uh, metastatic 
uh, diseases like from the breast for example you remember that uh, all the orbital components are are prone to a metastatic disease and also you may got extension of, uh, of the malignant processes from the nearby head and neck uh, structures into the orbital cavity the primary neoplasms affecting the orbit may include the rhabdomyosarcoma uh, especially seen in the children lymphoma may be seen in the children and in adults and also uh, this is a, a good suggestion for you if you see a single muscle affection particularly involving the superior rectus levator complex this is this is one of the uh, uh, suggesting criteria that uh, the underlying pathology may be a uh, lymphoma then here is a, a case of melanoma uh, 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 producing metastasis to the medial rectus muscle in the coronal image you see this mass involving the medial rectus muscle on the right side and this is the superior rectus which is normal and this is the optic nerve which is good lateral rectus and inferior rectus then uh, knowing the primary malignancy you can easily diagnose the possibility of metastatic disease and uh, this is a female patient with uh, disseminated breast malignancy and you see multiple irregular ill-defined masses within the left orbit and similar lesions within the right orbit and this has been proved to be uh, metastatic deposits to the orbital cavity then we came to the uh, uh, the fifth region in the orbit we have finished the the globe we have finished the the optic nerve the lacrimal gland and the extraocular muscles and we are left by uh, the fat and the, the bony orbits then if you le if you see a lesion within the orbital fat how to deal with first you should ensure that this lesion is in the orbital fat how can you ensure that uh, this by asking yourself about the lesion is this lesion inside the globe no is this lesion uh, arising from the optic nerve no arising from the lacrimal gland no arising from the extraocular muscles no then it will be located within the fat after accurately uh, diagnosing the lesion within the fat then look at the lesion is it ill-defined or well-defined if it in, uh, if it is an ill-defined infiltrative pathology then think of orbital pseudotumor supported by the clinical data but if the lesion is well defined look at the enhancement if it is not enhancing meaning that it is a cyst containing fluid within the orbit then the possibilities may uh, in the form of dermoid or epidermoid cyst if it is homogeneously enhancing then think of cavernous hemangioma as the first possibility which is the most common homogeneously enhancing intraorbital fat lesion within in adults then also you you may put in the differential diagnosis in neurofibroma from the peripheral nerves within the orbit not from the optic nerve the optic nerve does not give a neurofibroma the optic nerve has no neurolimal sheath the optic nerve gives rise to glioma from the optic nerve fibers and meningioma from its meningeal covering then also think of lymphoma whenever the lesions are multiple then starting the differential diagnosis orbital pseudotumor as i have mentioned is an inflammatory uh, uh, disease in the orbit of unknown etiology then you got this uh, classic appearance of the congested eye the red conjunctiva and sometimes uh, uh, frequent lacrimation the orbital pseudotumor affects the fat affects the extraocular muscles one or two and affects usually the lacrimal gland and this is a good example actually of the orbital pseudotumor by ct you got the full-blown picture of orbital pseudotumor here if you look carefully and you can see the fat is dirty and the fat is not that clear similar to the opposite orbit and he got too many reticulations due to congestion and inflammation also one of the good manifestations of orbital pseudotumor is the thickening of the posterior sclera 
and you can see here and then that the posterior sclera is appreciably uh, thickened then one of or two of the extraocular muscles may be prominent and also the lacrimal gland may be prominent then orbital pseudotumor is a reactive inflammatory disease of a non etiology it is usually unilateral but sometimes may be bilateral and then the presentation is usually by painful prototic eye and you got a, 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 a reticulated appearance of the fat and the involvement of the of one usually one of the extra ocular muscles the clinical data are very important here to reach the diagnose orbital pseudotumor by mri t1 fat suppression after contrast injection and you see that the lacrimal gland is swollen and enhanced the uh, eyelid is swollen and enhanced also the very orbital soft tissue structures some fine reticulations in the orbital fat and mild thickening of the posterior is clear and this is also an orbital pseudotumor of the right orbit here you see involvement of the medial rectus muscle and some inflammatory reaction outside or let us say medial to the medial rectus muscle reticulated appearance of the intraorbital uh, fat and this is together with the clinical data of the patient then you are able to diagnose orbital pseudotum then if you see a well-defined by well-defined i mean you can you can outline the whole margin of the of the lesion if you see a well-defined lesion within the orbital cavity and this lesion is enhancing think of cavernous hemangioma first of all you you ask yourself is this lesion inside the globe no it can arise from the optic nerve no from the muscles no from the lacrimal gland no then this lesion will be in the orbital fat the most common homogeneously enhancing intraorbital lesion within the orbital fat is cavernous hemangioma in adults then you see a lesion posterior to the globe and is clearly separable from the optic nerve in the coronal image and the, the lesion is homogeneously enhanced then you know that this is a cavernous hemangioma Another example of a cavernous hemangioma in the right orbit, and you see the homogeneously enhanced pattern of the lesion and its relation to the lower aspect of the optic nerve. Then neurofibromas and the schwannomas can also occur inside the orbit, and uh, it is usually difficult to differentiate both. Uh, by imaging but uh, MRI may be helpful since you know that cavernous hemangioma is usually very bright in the T2 weighted image while the neurofibroma is usually of intermediate signal then it also the hemangioma enhances uh, vividly by contrast while the schwannoma and the neurofibroma are less enhancing but uh, if you are in the differential diagnosis you should uh, select the common uh, lesion in the orbit which is the cavernous uh, hemangioma then uh, uh, lymphoma can also occur within the orbital fat you remember lymphoma can affect the lacrimal gland lymphoma can affect the extraocular muscles also lymphoma can involve the intraorbital fat one of the best characters of lymphoma in the orbit is the tendency to coat the globe you see the region is almost encasing the globe especially along its posterior aspect lymphomatous lesions are homogeneously enhanced and they do not contain calcium especially if you see multiple lesions or bilateral pathology then you think you think of lymphoma and this is also an example of intraorbital lymphoma you see uh, affection of the extraocular muscles tendency to coat the globe involvement of the lacrimal glands as well all these can be uh, uh, affected by lymphoma when to suspect the possibility of lymphoma uh, in an orbit in an intraorbital lesion number one if the patient is already known to have lymphoma and you have an orbital pathology consider it lymphoma a middle-aged patient with multiple masses homogeneously enhanced masses within the the orbit or within both orbits and you think of lymphoma 
lesions encasing the globe well defined lesions with homogeneous enhancement surrounding the globe and finally the lesion which is confined to the superior rectus levator uh, complex is usually suggestive of lymphoma then lesions which are well defined but appear cystic then uh, you see here this is the globe and this is a cyst containing fluid within the orbital cavity the cyst may be dermoid or epidermoid and uh, the, the presence of fat is not necessary for the, the diagnosis of dermoid cyst but if you see fat within the lesion and you think of dermoid more better than epidermoid and this is an example of dermoid cyst seen in the anterior aspect of the right orbital cavity and this is an epidermoid cyst uh, or maybe a dermoid cyst within the left orbital uh, cavity then this is also a good example of a fat containing lesion within the left orbit and you see this is the lesion displacing the superior rectus and the lateral recti uh, the lateral rectus muscle representing an intraorbital dermoid cyst then uh, this is a lesion containing fluid and this lesion is separable from the muscles and the nerve and you know that this is maybe may represent epidermoid or dermoid if you want to select a possibility because of the absence of fat you may think of epidermoid cyst but you should know that fat is not an essential diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis of dermoid cyst within the orbit then uh, this is a, a, a diagnost diagnostic dilemma whenever you are confronted by a huge mass in the orbit of a child remember that I, I put this rule for children only if you see a mass which is big inside the orbit of a child look to the globe if the globe is not identified whether it is removed or not then you consider the possibility of retinoblastoma either primary or recurrent then this is a, a, a child three years old with a big mass obliterating the globe showing dense calcification and also uh, filling the uh, orbital cavity then you know that this is retinoblastoma and after uh, you diagnose retinoblastoma you look for the opposite orbit for bilaterality you look intracranially to assess the possibility of intracranial extension then if you see the globe think of masses that are seen usually in a children and they are big then these masses are lymphangioma or cystic hygroma capillary hemangioma this is an infiltrative lesion uh, different quite different from the cavernous hemangioma which is seen in adults then hemangiopericytoma rhabdomyosarcoma and the plexiform neurofibroma then this is a child and you cannot see the globe there is a big mass then you think of retinoblastoma as i have mentioned but in order to diagnose lymphangioma or cystic hygroma the the only diagnostic criteria for this is the presence of multiple fluid level if you see a big cystic lesion within the the orbit of a child uh, with uh, multiple uh, fluid levels within the cystic lesion and think of lymphangioma or cystic hygroma but if you see an extensive pathology and this is an enhancing lesion in a child remember that I am dealing with children only then you see an extensive mass which is strongly enhancing and it displaces the globe uh, uh, anteriorly and the, if you look carefully outside the, the orbit and the brain you see multiple dilated tortuous vessels and in the coronal image you see also enhancing vessels intracranially then you know that this is capillary hemangioma then uh, what are what is the differential diagnosis of vascular lesions inside the orbit any we have mentioned uh, the cavernous hemangioma which is well defined homogeneous enhanced lesion in others the capillary hemangioma which is an ill-defined lesion is strongly enhancing in its children the carotid cavernous fistula i will mention orbital arterial venous malformation orbital varix orbital venous malformation, melanotic melanoma we have mentioned, hemangiobericytoma, and hypervascular uh, metastatic deposits. 
This is just an example of carotid cavernous fistula, and I will mention this many times in the head and neck imaging course. I have mentioned this in the paracellular area, and uh, once more, you see the carotid cavernous fistula is usually post-traumatic, leading to direct communication between the cavernous sinus and the intracavernous part of the internal carotid artery. This will lead to increase in the pressure within the sinus and the impedance of the venous return towards the sinus, then this will result in the characteristic dilatation of the superior ophthalmic vein. And you see enlargement of the region of the cavernous uh, sinus. Then uh, facial and orbital uh, arteriovenous malformation, and you know this is a very big cirrhoid aneurysm affecting a good part of the face, and uh, it has a component within the uh, orbital cavity. Then uh, orbital varix is an uncommon vascular malformation and is composed of enlarged single or multiple venous uh, channels. And these venous uh, channels will distend on Valsalva maneuver and they will show evident post contrast enhancement. They are direct directly communicated to the uh, systemic venous uh, system and they are considered as uh, uh, congenital lesions if they are primary occurring inside the orbit only. But secondary orbital varix are acquired due to increased blood flow as a result of intracranial AVM or as a result of carotid cavernous fistula or dural arteriovenous fistula. And how to diagnose the orbital varix? This is a simple way and this is the uh, uh, scan obtained with, without contrast injection and this is the scan after contrast injection with Valsalva maneuver and you got uh, significant enhancement and the distension of the orbital varix. The orbital uh, venous malformation is quite different from the orbital varix since uh, this is a, 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 an accumulation or multiple uh, venous channels that can also distend with Valsalva maneuver but uh, not all these lesions will enhance significantly uh, with contrast medium. Then uh, hemangiobericytoma is a vascular lesion which can affect the head and neck and also can uh, arise inside the orbit or extend from the nearby uh, baronasal sinuses, for example, into the orbital cavity.